Hi, this is David Bedford. 6th of July 1957 is arguably the most important day in Beatles history. It's the day that John met Paul for the first time. So we're going to start a small series looking at the day John met Paul. So don't forget to subscribe. So make sure you don't miss out on the, the future films coming up. This one is uh, myself in conversation with Professor Paul Farley, who's a professor of poetry at Lancaster University. And we're looking at the importance of that day and also the importance of John Lennon's father figure, his uncle George. So of course here in St Peter's uh, graveyard on the day John met Paul, 6th of July, 1957, um, after the quarrymen went round the village on the float, they would have gone off and they would have walked down this path, which would have taken you into the field over there, which is where the famous photograph was taken. And of course, in getting to that field, John would have walked straight past his uncle George's grave. Which is just here. Um, I find that extraordinary. I find it extraordinarily moving, actually, that it was so close, the proximity of the place where he played a gig and um, his uncle was buried. And only a couple of years before this gig is being played. Um, and he would have had to have passed it. He would have known it was there. Yeah. He had all kinds of allegiances and associations with with the church since Sunday school. Yeah. He would have known it since he was a kid. It's just... just um, it's just very moving, and especially once you start to appreciate what a role his uncle played in his early life, encouraging him to read and to take an interest in words and in language. I'm really intrigued that he used the Liverpool Echo yeah. to do this, because it's a newspaper, and you can think about newspapers in Lennon's work. You can just take that line of influence, you know. So, I don't know, he produces his own newspaper, The Daily yeah. Howl, um, a schoolboy um, edition. And then uh, years later, I read the news today, oh boy, a day in the life, you know, of, of yeah. Sergeant Peppers. So um, just in that sense, there's that kind of thread of influence. But there's also, a, there's got to have been a kind of broader love of language, I would say, that had been kind of um, encouraged by, by his uncle, who died very suddenly by all accounts. Yeah, and it's, it's one of those sad things about that relationship, because John and Uncle George were very close. He was the, the stable father figure in John's life, and then to suddenly to lose him when John's only 14 years old um, must have been absolutely devastating for him. Um, and I believe when John went to the art college, he wore his Uncle George's coat every day until it literally fell off him. He was a big influence in his life. Um, even musically, Uncle George gave John his very first harmonica. So there's even a musical influence uh, in John's life, saying, you know, encourage him, play music, and just wonder, on that day when the quarry men were playing here, how much did John think about his uncle George? I think I wish he was there to watch him. The first thing you hear, the first thing most people would have heard by the Beatles was that harmonica blasting on Love Me Do. Yeah, no, it's extraordinary, it really is. Um, so do you get the sense that it was a kind of good cop, bad cop? Um, Fosterage. I mean, was it a kind of? Um, I mean, you often see this, don't you? You know, one parent has to assume that tough role, yeah. and the other one can be more, more forgiven, uh, yeah. more of a nurturing sort of figure. And George was that, and then, and then gone. Yeah, and I think that was the tough thing for Mimi because she was the disciplinarian. She was the strict one. Um, if you look at the the photos, you've got Mimi standing with John, holding hands in the garden at Mendips, but it looks quite staged. Whereas you look at the relationship between George and John, they've got arms around each other. It's obviously a close relationship. And at times Mimi was quite jealous mm. of the relationship that John and Uncle George had. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so with him suddenly gone, it was very, very hard then for Mimi to try and be both parents because it didn't come naturally to her. And she was the strict one. And either John loved her, but they often clashed as you can understand it. And of course, when they did clash, Uncle George wasn't there then as, as the mediator. Looking at these photographs, David, under blue suburban skies, it, this looks like a hundred years ago. Um, I know it's only about 60 years ago. Uncle George looks like an Edwardian. Uh, Mimi looks like something from an Agatha Christie novel. Um, this, this, I mean, the past is another country, but this is this feels like such a long time ago now, and it's, yeah. it, it 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 shows that these guys were children of the forties and fifties, um, who, who, who became influential in the sixties, but they weren't children of the sixties. Not at all. And you've almost got bordering Victorian to Edwardian parents, and all the Beatles had that. 
So there was a, a different age, a different view of parenting. Um, but I like the fact with these photos, you've got John in his short pants, of course, for school, but with a sort of a glint in his eye, again, getting back to just William, mm. you can see that being acted out again. There's a little bit of mischief there. Mm. Um, and that mischief he shared with Uncle George. Um, and a lot of that came from the radio, because of course Uncle George installed um, the speaker into John's bedroom. And he loved things like Dick Barton, Special Agent. Um, but of course, as they were growing up, all of the lads, they loved the goons. And you can see in John's writing, uh, whether it's poetry or his singing, that kind of zany humour from the goons mm. being a, a big influence mm. on him. Another thing that's odd looking at this photograph, and I'm being kind of um, forced to think about it because of, of, of where we're sitting, um, but the way we look at them has changed, um, or has changed so much in the years that he grew up. Um, I can tell the mid 50s from the mid 60s. In fact, the 60s are so kind of compressed. You can tell the early 60s from the late yeah. 60s, and not just from the fashion, but from the way the photograph is taking the texture, the medium of, of, of looking and of listening. You know, we go from mono to stereo, we yeah. go from black and white to colour. And these guys grew up and lived through that enormous kind of technological uh, yeah. leap forward. Whereas now, if you said to me now, this is 2003, yeah. this is 2010. Okay, if you, you say tell. so, I yeah. can't tell the difference. So it's something about the rate of change, the way the world was, was yeah. shifting or starting to shift quickly after this period of, of it being very still and very bombed out after yeah. the war. And again, like we're saying, it's very suburban. It's yeah. not working class hero. And a lot of people associate John with that song. Though, of course, in the lyrics, John never claims to be working class. It's almost... Uh, it's like a downward aspiration. Mm. Because as we've seen, it, he has a very middle class upbringing. Mm. But he wants to get rid of those shackles and be seen as working class. Mm. Even with the accentuating the Liverpool accent, which he didn't have naturally. He actually wanted to be seen as a lower class, whereas most people aspired to, to go higher. I think the city and its language, its earthier, saltier, its working class language is really important to him. And Ringo was a kind of conduit for that because um, Eight days a week, tomorrow never knows, um, a hard day's night. They're all Ringoisms. Yeah. Um, they're all coming from the city in, and, and, yeah. and the Beatles pouncing on them. So there's an odd class thing going on in that group. It's yeah. a kind of four-way thing. Um, they're kind of predating or feeding off each other, you know, in, in, a, in a really kind of fruitful, creative way. But the, the class dynamic in that group is really, really odd. People get it all wrong, I think. Yeah. And I think that, I know Paul has described going into Mendips and just being amazed at the luxury of it and seeing all these classic books which John had read. Mm. And just the fact of going into a house, we had a bathroom and a toilet in it. Mm -hmm. You know, that in itself almost separated working class mm. from middle class. Mm. John was the posh kid mm. and he's not this earthy, scouser, mm. working class lad, mm. which maybe Brian tried to portray when he was packaging the Beatles mm. together. Mm. You know, it was a middle class upbringing. Mm. He was well read, he was well educated. I love that as the, obviously the, the support and encouragement from uh, his uncle George in particular. Another thing I'm thinking is that they were all, apart from Ringo, funnily enough, I think Ringo was kind of very much a child of the city and the dingle, but I think the rest of them were kind of outskirts kids. You know, they were, they were kind of a band of outlaws, if you like, or they were kind of continuation of this gang Lennon had started with his Just William friends from, from very early on, from when they yeah. were wearing short pants. But then I don't know. I mean, they were all they all moved around a lot. Um, Lennon, after a, a tumultuous first few years, he, he kind of got some stability here. But George and Paul bounced around a fair bit on the outskirts of Liverpool. And the city it reflects what was happening in the city. I suppose it was a city on the move and trying Absolutely. to trying to find its shape again after being hammered during the yeah. war. And they were, they were creating these new towns and uh, Speak was the new housing estate they created mm. on farmland at the very south of Liverpool. McCartney's end up there, 1947, and then the Harrisons move on to the same estate in 1950. Mm. And so because Paul and George are going to the same school, they have the same uniform, they meet on the bus. Mm. Mm. So they're very much from the south are travelling into the city, mm. whereas, as you say, Ringo, very much from the inner city and stayed where he was born, where he grew up, whereas the others moved around. Mm. Uh, but John sort of got that stability with Mendips. And then, obviously, when he went to art college, it was more fun. 
mm. and more freedom mm. to move into the city centre and right by the art college. But it's all about moving about. It's all about a kind of mobility, isn't it? And I think in Liverpool in the late 50s and early 60s, you get this kind of microcosm of what the 60s was, or at least it, some people get very cynical about the 60s and think it was like 600 people in a nightclub in, in <laughs> London somewhere. Yeah. And that was the 60s. You know, most, for most people, it didn't register. But I don't know. I mean, I like the idea of it being a mix of classes and, and, and um, things rubbing up against each other, you know. Um, and I think that, that, that happened in microcosm in Liverpool. And it was only because the city was on the move and because people were being displaced and moving about yeah. that, that this band um, got together. Otherwise, it, they wouldn't have met each other, you know. Or it would have been a... Um, it, it would have been a lot more difficult for them to have, yeah. have, have, have met. I mean, when I think of them, I, I don't think doing this boundary walk today around um, South Liverpool has changed my view. If anything, it's only intensified it. It's gobby, yeah. troubled, creative. Um, a kind of, a, a kind of very messed up um, kid. Probably quite a cruel kid. The way adolescent boys can be cruel, but some, somebody who needed needed a, a kind of rock in his life. You know, needed stability. Gained it and lost it several times, I think. Um, and somebody who was, who was kind of fearless with all of that, um, maybe because of that or in spite of that, I don't know. Um, my favourite story about him is still about them taking the stage at the um, Palladium when they played the Royal Variety performance. And that famous line about um, cheap sh seats clap your hands, the rest of you wrapped in jewellery. He was going to say something else. Yeah. He was going to swear, he was going to say, rattle your jewellery. And I've heard people begged him not to. And I often wonder what would have happened to play this little counterfactual thing. Yeah. What would have happened if he hadn't done that? Um, would they have become the Rolling Stones? I, I think it would have been worse than that. Yeah. I don't think the world was ready for that sort of thing. Definitely not. In fact, it was a long time after that that Grundy and the Sex Pistols happened, and look at the fuss that caused. Yeah. So I think he would have derailed his own group just by being um, by being himself. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I I certainly see a lad who went through a series of traumas of not having a relationship with his father. His father's away during the war. Um, his mum has other relationships which confuse him. He's moved around between different members of the family before eventually, at the age of five, he's settled with his Uncle George uh, and Aunt Mimi. And that gives him that stability he needs after a, a really chaotic few years. Um, but then, you say you get the trauma of, of losing your father figure, his beloved Uncle George, at the age of 14, by which time he's re-established a relationship with his mum who becomes a massive influence in his life. Mm. And then suddenly she's killed. So he's had another devastation at the age of 17. He's into his music and his next closest friend becomes Stuart Sutcliffe, who then drops dead at the age of 21 in Hamburg. And I think in a way, I see John as someone with a lot of demons. And I think each of these things gets buried deeper and deeper. And I think he went from the fun-loving Just William as a kid to living in his imagination in Strawberry Field in Alice in Wonderland and to having a bit of freedom at our college before Brian comes along, does what he needs to do, but he sticks him in a suit and says, I want you to be sweet, poppy, happy John Lennon the Beatle in a suit. And he has to become somebody he's not naturally. And that takes him a few years before he can get rid of the suit and become him, which not everybody liked. <laughs>